Welcome to today's presentation, What is Treatment? A quick overview of American Society of Addiction Medicine, or ASAM, treatment criteria. This webinar series is made possible by a grant award from SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. We are excited to provide this virtual series during the month of September, which is National Recovery Month. Today's session is being recorded and will be uploaded to the CMH YouTube channel for future reference. Please feel free to use the chat box to ask questions and add comments you have at any time during the webinar. If time allows, we'll do our best to answer as many questions as we can at the end of the presentation. Our presenter today is Ken Hubelman. Ken is a clinical coordinator and outpatient therapist at Odyssey House. And with that, I will turn it over to Ken. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you all for joining me this morning. Um, so the presentation I have today is what is treatment? Quick overview of American Society of Addiction Medicine or ASAM treatment criteria. Uh, this is something that is used by addiction professionals. Uh, I wouldn't want to say nationwide, but it's not a mandated uh, system, but it is a commonly used to determine uh, what kind of treatment makes sense for what individuals. Um, the basis of this uh, training or webinar is to give a basic understanding of the six dimensions of uh, the assessment and then ASAM levels of care. Uh, this came out of a desire to help explain what treatment is. It's a common word we hear or that people use. Um, they'll see someone in their office as maybe a, a, a probation officer, as a uh, educator, as a family member. Uh, we see it a lot in uh, court orders from judges that a person is court ordered to treatment. Um, as an addiction professional, to hear the word treatment, we understand that's a large uh, spectrum or continuum of levels of care. Uh, so today through this, the goal is to help you kind of better understand what kind of treatment modalities exist. And then also uh, how a addiction professional would kind of determine what is the best fit for that individual. Um, it's that viewpoint of, hey, I know someone is struggling. I know they need treatment, but if we put them in the wrong kind of treatment, uh, it's not as likely to be effective. If we place them in something too restrictive, they tend to rebel against. If it's not, um, if it's not a, if it's not a high enough amount or it's not intense enough, uh, then they continue to struggle because they needed more supports uh, from a treatment provider. Uh, so, to get into this, the first step is: is there a need for treatment in the United States? Uh, that's kind of a rhetorical question, because um, I would assume most people understand that, yes, uh, there is a small substance abuse problem across the country. Uh, as you can see, based on this SAMHSA study uh, or survey, uh, American adults in 2018, over 19 million with a SUD or substance use disorder, 47.6 uh, with a mental health disorder, and then what would be known as co-occurring or dual diagnosis, that is the 9.2 million that have both the substance use and mental health disorder. Uh, so as you can see, that's a large percentage. I think, um, I'm not positive on this from the numbers I saw was 7.3% of all people in Michigan uh, have received treatment, I believe within a year. Um, I'm not positive on that one, but it's about 7% of folks uh, a year are getting some form of treatment just in Michigan. Um, so a quick uh, understanding of who and what ASAM is. Uh, ASAM is a group of medical, uh, medical providers, clinicians, and associated professionals. Um, they have come together to create uh, this uh, guideline or criteria to help identify appropriate care for individuals with MESUD. Um, they are currently redesigning it. There is some attempts to add possibly some uh, additional dimensions um, that is still in the planning phase and hasn't been out. Uh, so this is something that's been around for a while. Uh, this training goes off of the third edition of patient placement criteria. Um, so it's looking at that. So that broad question to start, what is treatment? Um, as a treatment provider, we look at those as levels of care. 
Uh, as you can see, there is nine separate levels of care that would uh, vary based on their focus, their intensity, uh, and for some of them, the amount of time a person would be in that level of care. Um, so as you can see, each level is uh, numeric and they slowly move up. Um, to explain these from the least intensive, that is a word you'll probably hear me more often. Um, one of the guides is to place someone in the least restrictive or least intensive level of care necessary. Um, we don't want to do overkill. We don't want to place them in something that is just more than they need uh, because it tends to not work and the person then leaves treatment more often. Um, so we want to put something in that is appropriate, but also the least restrictive. Um, sometimes it is also a, a uh, start at this level. If this doesn't work, let's see if we go up or down. Um, so it is based on a, a continuum of care. So the first level is level 0.5 or 0 0.5. This is early intervention. Um, this is for those that are at risk. Um, an at-risk population could be it, it's teenage. Uh, this is adolescents in lower income communities. This is lower income communities as a whole. Uh, so generalized populations of focus uh, that are identified as being at risk for substance use. That would be secondary prevention. Um, indicated prevention is someone that may have used substances already, but doesn't meet the clinical uh, clinical diagnosis of a substance use disorder. This might be the person that drinks occasionally, uh, but may have gotten themselves into legal trouble that then needs some sort of education to prevent this from becoming a, a greater problem. Uh, this could be your 19 year old with a minor in possession that, you know, maybe has drank twice in their life. It's not a problem per se yet, um, but it looks like based on some of the criteria, it would make sense. So that's what indicated prevention. And then secondary again, is that a uh, greater population of focus that is at risk for it. Um, I used to take offense to that when it said teenage and male was a risk factor. And then I remember being a teenage male and said, oh yeah, okay, never mind, I get it now. Um, so some of these are experts, uh, uh, screening, brief intervention, referral to treatment. Uh, these can be done in a hospital setting, uh, DUI courses. So some states uh, mandate a, a specific course called Prime for Life. Uh, there are other courses um, after someone receives any DUI related uh, offense. Um, an EAP or an employee assistance program, um, you may not have come in drunk, but an injury stated, you tested positive. So they want you to go through something that will educate you on the risks of continued drug and alcohol use. Um, these can happen in almost any setting, hospital, schools, uh, workplace, in home. Uh, these are those, uh, you know, oftentimes one, two hours where someone will come and talk about really the dangers of drug abuse and issues, um, similar to like a DARE program that many, many of us can remember from uh, school. Uh, moving up the continuum to a slightly more intense, but still really a low lower intensity program would be outpatient. Um, this is, it's organized around uh, the, the client to address behaviors, lifestyle, mindset, and that use. So this is someone to get here has been identified as having a substance use disorder. Uh, and to kind of understand substance use disorders, they're split out by specific uh, uh, drug or alcohol. So an alcohol use disorder, opiate use disorder, stimulant type, um, cocaine use. And each one of those diagnoses then comes with a specifier of mild, moderate, severe, based on the number of criteria met. Uh, so a person might have an alcohol use disorder, severe and mild. So we're looking at uh, how we adjust those behaviors to fit. Um, outpatient level one, uh, often a step down. Uh, it is kind of that final level of care before a person is, is completely discharged of treatment and then is working at a self-directed level of care. Uh, so this can be a step down. They might have done residential, step down to a more intensive day treatment, IOP, uh, down to this. This ranges, uh, this can be someone that you meet with once a month individually for 45 minutes to an hour. So once monthly appointments with an individual counselor, 
uh, this can go all the way up to eight, eight hours of treatment in a week. So I might do two or three groups plus meet with my counselor every week. Uh, that still fits into this outpatient world. Um, the outpatient world is an easier sell. So if you have someone that's struggling, but is in what we would call a pre-contemplation stage or contemplation where they're not really sure they want to change. Um, the way I used to always sell outpatient when I worked at a, a facility was you get to go home, um, which some people will be more willing to go try this level, knowing that if it, you know they're not staying there, you're not at a residential setting, you get to go home. Um, this is a more frequently court ordered level of care. Um, this could be for someone that's just starting. Uh, they might not know how to get clean. They might just need a little bit of help. You know, they've been maybe able to white knuckle a month or two, uh, but just need some assistance to get through it. This is also good for individuals that might have six months to a year clean, uh, but life is happening. Um, just because individuals uh, gain recovery doesn't mean life still doesn't kick them. Um, so this can be that good ongoing maintenance. You can stay in this outpatient level of care two years, four years, five years, uh, while you're continuing to work on uh, those coping skills and things. Uh, next up from outpatient would be that intensive outpatient. This is IOP. Uh, we have nine to 19 hours of structured programming. It's generally uh, organized by multiple groups within a week, and then an individual session once or every two, once or twice, um, one, once or twice uh, a week. Um, so these can be a lot of different modalities for those groups. Some of it is recreational therapy, art therapy. Uh, it can be working on occupational skills or helping with job searching, um, creating some of those higher level needs. Um, but still the person is, you know, they're still going home. There's still some sort of supportive structure within their life to help them maintain their recovery efforts when they leave the office. Um, where they go home has support. They've got some employment. They've got some coping skills. Uh, they just kind of need that frequent reminder. I am still working on recovery. It is a higher level of groups, uh, helps them move through some of those uh, stronger concerns they may have. Uh, a lot of outpatient is integrated care or an interdisciplinary team. Uh, big words for we coordinate with a mental health provider. We also work on, so we, we as an addiction professional would focus on the SUD. You may need additional mental health treatment uh, to manage your stabilized care. Uh, this might be psychiatric care. Uh, it'll coordinate with a primary care physician, dental, uh, really helping that person reorganize the things that might have gotten off track due to their use disorder. Um, stepping up again from 2.1 goes to 2.5. This is partial hospitalization. Uh, it's also known as day treatment. Um, this is 20 or more hours per week. Uh, I can think of the way our our facilities programming works for a day treatment is uh, nine to two Monday through Friday. Uh, so the individual is there Monday through Friday. They are there most of the afternoon, but they are still again going home afterwards to some, poor, some support or structure that can help them maintain. Um, so this is still that level that they are doing it on their own. They do go out uh, and experience some of the real world problems or can run into some of those concerns, but they've got some level of stability um, that they can maintain till they come back tomorrow morning. Uh, it's not the most common level of care, um, but it is one that often can be added on to maybe an outpatient assisted recovery housing. A lot of the outpatient is uh, done in conjunction with recovery or supportive housing, uh, also known as three quarter houses um, that can provide the ability for some level of, I don't want to say freedom, that sounds like a horrible word, um, some level of less structure, but also having a supportive environment to go home to. Um, with the 2.5, again, regular monitoring of mental and physical health. Uh, so this might be someone that is starting new meds a little bit less stabilized, um, and it's really going to take some 
monitoring to make sure that this individual is appropriate. Is their support at home actually supported or was it not as supportive as they may have intended? Um, so those first four levels of care there, the 0 0.5, 1, 2.1, and 2.5, those would all be done in that outpatient setting. Uh, 1, 2, 1, 2, 5, generally done in an office, 0.5, really can occur anywhere. They might come into a workplace, a school. Um, they might just be a weekend one-time class. Uh, one, two, one, two, five are gonna be ongoing. Um, uh, outpatient level one, that again, I can think of in my experience, clients with two, four, five years of ongoing treatment just to continue to uh, move through, not as much the SUD issues, but those relapse triggers. Um, they may have it, nailed down, but if we go back to work, all of us probably have the stressors of work and we may still need some ongoing counseling to manage life on life's terms. So moving up from the outpatient levels of care, uh, I think we go to what many see as treatment. Um, this is that uh, uh, residential services. This is where we're going somewhere where we're going to stay. Um, all the level threes um, are clinically managed residential services. This is that 24 hour setting. You are there. You're going to stay there, eat there, sleep there, do all the things there. Um, the majority of level threes, uh, there may be some, I don't know, that don't do this, but I, I would say all, but I'm hesitant. Uh, the reminder is that the locks are on the outside to keep people from coming in. Um, the doors generally don't lock from the inside. So despite it being a 24 hour residential uh, setting, there is still the opportunity for many individuals to walk away uh, against medical advice or AMA. Um, and that's one of those where the wrong level of care uh, can be a problem because if it's too intense, it's a little more than that person needed. Um, they might not feel a fit. They might not be able to relate to the services around them. Uh, so their desire is, nope, I can go do this on my own, and they go home um, with obviously varying successes. Um, part of the level three cares is the therapeutic atmosphere, just being with and around other people in, uh, with addiction concerns that are working to resolve them. Um, another major part of these level three uh, residential facilities is it's the environment. I have somewhere to go. So an individual's homeless, uh, comes from a domestic violence situation, uh, their significant other or family members they live with are currently or actively using as well. Um, it's not the greatest environment for a person to focus on their SUD concerns and move forward. Uh, so the level threes create that. With a 3-1, so level 3.1 is that low intensity residential, um, five hours a week of direct, uh, direct clinical services. So they're still there 24 hours, but at least five hours are focused on direct clinical treatment. Um, one of the benefits of this is that it's a practice uh, in a safe environment. If I'm being told to learn how to deal with my anger or learn how to effectively communicate that I'm, you know, frustrated with you. If I haven't developed those skills well, having a safe, controlled, like environment to practice that gives me an opportunity to build that confidence that I can do it. Um, it creates that through that supportive environment. This is that opportunity that if I try to do things and it doesn't go the way I expected, I have treatment right there. I have clinical services available. I have someone that I can turn to and then immediately work on what I can do to make my efforts work better. Um, this is that interpersonal communication. How do I talk to people? Am I good at dealing with social situations? Uh, many individuals who have an SUD, isolation, uh, antisocial-like behaviors, those things have broken apart communication and interpersonal skills. Um, having a structured environment to learn how to interact with people, uh, having a structured environment to start to make some of those phone calls to family to start to restore 
uh, strained relationships. This gives that place to do it. Um, that can be a little more difficult outside of that environment. Uh, clinical focus, and there's my first typo, awesome. Uh, clinical focus on uh, dimensions four, five, and six. And those of you with no experience in the SUD world will say, what the hell was dimension four, five, and six? We'll see that in a little bit. Um, so this is focusing on some of those areas uh, to address, to move to a less intense. Uh, three, three, level 3.3 is probably the least available service out there. Uh, it is specialized uh, or population specific high intensity. Uh, so level 3.3 is designed for the cognitively impaired or limited. Uh, so those individuals with uh, intellectual or uh, developmental disability. Uh, this may be an individual with a traumatic brain injury that makes it difficult for them to uh, regulate their emotions. Um, so these are a very specific population. And unfortunately, when you become part of a small population within a small population, services don't exist at the level they do for others. Um, just because a person has some cog cognitive issues or some impairments doesn't mean they can't succeed at a different level of care. Um, level 3.3 is just a primary focus on those and their specific uh, concerns that that population has. Um, so you could still possibly have someone in a 3.1, 3.5, or an outpatient level of care with some cognitive concerns. Um, this just provides that, uh, like it says here, kind of that habilitation, a spot where might be a stronger focus on learning coping skills that just weren't there or uh, a more slow paced opportunity to take that time and understand the specific needs of the cognitively impaired and limited. Um, another part is designed to assist these individuals in creating ADLs uh, or activities of daily living, um, helping them learn how to set calendars, appointments, make their own appointments, uh, to do a lot of things for themselves. Um, it is often seen in a uh, substance use disorder world, we'll have a lot of individuals that I have seen uh, that might be cognitively limited and out of well-meaning intentions, most of the things have been done for them. They'll have a payee, they don't make their appointments, they've got a case manager through a program that does a lot of the things for them. So the individual hasn't learned how to do them and then with nothing but time and a steady income, they may turn to drugs and alcohol to fill that free time. So part of the focus of a 3-3 is to uh, help create that independence. Um, they still might not be able to reach a full independence as someone with uh, a higher cognitive ability, uh, but it's helping them understand and regain what they can do within the limitations of their uh, cognitive range. Uh, moving up from that is to level 3.5, uh, high intensity residential. Uh, so this is for those individuals with the significant social and psychological concerns. Um, this is often uh, things that might be done in a Department of Corrections uh, atmosphere. This may be those individuals who, again, have spent a significant time being outside of societal norms. So antisocial type behaviors, isolation, um, just some of those things that have separated them from individuals. So this is that higher concern. Um, this is probably 3.1 and 3.5 are probably the more apparent, 3.5 for sure, um, that it's clear that this person needs to step out. Outpatient is not what they need. Um, this is a person that can't put more than 48 hours of abstinence together without using again. Um, they just lack appropriate coping skills. They know they wanna stop, they need to stop, but they just can't. Um, this is the daily user that is struggling. Um, this is also for those that might not have uh, uh, good relationships. This is the domestic violence, this is partners or significant others that are actively in addiction 
or all of their social skills are addiction based. Um, this is the person that the only people they talk to are the people that can use with them, drink with them, um, that have no life uh, for the most part outside of their addiction. Um, so it's a major part again, is that focus for the level 3.5 is reintegration. How do we get you from an addictive type behavioral uh, attitude? Um, so to understand that is, um, I, I, I guess, dog eat dog or that where the world revolves around drugs and alcohol, the focus of a nine to five job of caring for my children, of being at family functions and barbecues, that stuff's gone. Um, we, uh, we would see these individuals uh, wholly consumed uh, by the addiction. Um, and that's that part is that we're gonna need some time to work on getting used to structure, to getting up and going to bed at a regular time, to you know, doing some of those basic everyday things that just went out the window due to a person's pursuit and use of drugs and alcohol. Um, you know, these might be people that are on a three, four, five year bender um, that just doesn't stop. They continually use and need a place to go step away and reset and relearn some of those pro-social skills. Um, moving up again from the 3.5 is the 3.7. So it, it's fairly similar. Uh, these next two, the three, seven, and the four are going to be probably some of your shorter stays. Um, these will be individuals with similarized problems, uh, but with stability being necessary. Um, so at a 3.7, as you can see, severe subacute medical, cognitive, emotional, or behavioral concerns. Um, this is the person who may have active psychosis, um, audio and visual hallucinations. Um, it's not something you're going to be able to treat. You can't just start asking someone how they're going to stop using drugs when they're actively in psychosis, uh, when they are in a manic state and unable to, uh, step out of that. The focus is not going to necessarily be, uh, drugs and alcohol. Um, we're going to need to work on those biomedical cognitive concerns to start with. Does a person have uh, some sort of renal failure? Uh, is there some sort of medical concern that needs to be stabilized uh, at a certain level of care? Um, this kind of would fit uh, within our organization we created. It's not quite the same, but it would be a medical recovery housing. Uh, so with a lot of individuals that were COVID positive, um, they were not being admitted into treatment facilities uh, because to bring a COVID positive individual into a residential cohort uh, was a, not the best idea. Uh, so it was the creation of medical recovery housing. So a COVID positive individual could still go somewhere and stabilize, but also have a safe structured environment. Um, it's not quite the same because the medical monitoring wasn't there. Uh, that person had significant COVID symptoms, then we're looking different because it's medically necessary that they have uh, 24 hour nursing care available. Um, that nursing staff is monitoring uh, that there's a physician regularly checking in on these folks. Um, this is often in an acute care hospital, uh, psychiatric facility. Um, this could be something uh, done at some of those hospitals or settings uh, where they're maybe not necessarily, uh, you know, they're still ambulatory, they're still able to get around, but they need that stabilization. So like I said, it's kind of a shorter level of care. Um, this might be, you know, a week, uh, 10 days to uh, stabilize a new medication, to stabilize some significant medical concerns upon entry. Uh, and then they would move down to that 3.5, 3, 3.3, 3, 3, 3, 1, uh, et cetera. Um, moving up from this one is a level four. This is medically managed intensive inpatient. So severe acute concerns. Um, this is a person, this is the highest level of care. This is the greatest level of severe. Um, this is, I don't wanna say near death, but probably very close to it. Uh, if we don't stop the drugs and alcohol uh, due to the concerns, this might be a person who is 
uh, actively using in psychosis and unable to uh, stabilize for a while. Um, this is going to need that psychiatric care, that physical or physician care, um, and then even nursing uh, 24 hour staff. So not necessarily the three seven is 24 hour on call nursing availability. Uh, this is regular nursing 24 seven on uh, staff. Um, again, to work at that stabilization, this is an individual that needs to get stabilized, excuse me, before we can move through and start to address uh, SUD concerns. Um, this is another level. Uh, this would be in hospital based. Um, this would be somewhere not as likely to be at a standard treatment facility, but a specialized uh, unit as well. So with those levels of care ranging from zero five to four, like I said, it's a continuum. Um, so you're going to identify which level of care is most appropriate. You're going to place them in that. So if the person is successful at a level of care, and has made steps to stabilize, to reestablish their quality of life, uh, things are moving forward. Uh, the intent would be to move to the next lower level of care. So that person has been successful at a 3.1, let's maybe step them down to a 2.5 where they're not staying here. They go to 20 plus hours of treatment, but they go home. They've identified some supports. It might be supportive housing, uh, it may be a family member who is uh, a positive support. And the goal is to slowly work our way from the most intense down to none. Um, I've always loved that counseling is one of those jobs where we are trying to put ourselves out of business. My goal is to help you get to where you need to so you don't need me anymore. Um, so creating that continuum. Another method of this is so we identify an individual, we place them in a 2.1 uh, so that intensive outpatient level of care, nine to 19 hours, they're doing fairly well, then they have a relapse. They're off using for a week or two. Uh, clearly, they need some more support than they were getting at this level of care. So what do we do to move them up? This might be a residential stay. Um, it seemed like you had it under control. It seemed that you had coping skills, but maybe they weren't as effective as you thought. So then we go up the levels of care. So this is a continuum designed for a person to move throughout it during their treatment time. Um, the mm, frustrating, a reality part is cool. We have all these levels of care, but do they exist? Uh, based on the survey of substance abuse treatment services that was done in 2020, um, nationally and through Michigan, these are the current numbers they have. Um, when I updated this PowerPoint from when I had done it last year and the data was out of 2018, um, it wasn't a good thing for Michigan. Our numbers and availabilities of treatment providers went down. Um, we saw some go up and others went down. I think the hospital inpatient went from 14 down to 10. Uh, we did see an additional four residential facilities open up. Um, and then I think some outpatients closed. Um, also, for those who know math, you might see that the numbers don't match the totals. Uh, that is because one facility might offer multiple levels of care. Uh, I, can, I can say at our Flint outpatient, we offer 2.5 down to 0 0.5. So that would be uh, four levels of care in one building. Um, so that's why those numbers don't match. Um, if you look at that residential level of care, so 3.1 through 3.7, uh, there's 93. That's just about one per county. Uh, but if we know St. Clair County, we don't have a residential. Lapeer doesn't have a residential. Sanilac doesn't have a residential. So many counties don't have a residential treatment provider in their county. Um, for St. Clair County, uh, level one, I would, and this is just a guess from my understanding of what's available in our county, uh, I'd say 10 to 15 uh, level one providers doing that outpatient, which is individuals might be a few groups a week. Um, level 2.1 in St. Clair County, um, again, best educated guess, we're talking two to four uh, IOP providers within the county. 
Uh, level 2.5, zero. Um, I am unaware of any day treatment or partial hospitalization programs in the county. Uh, then we move to residential, again, zero. Um, so this is one of those struggles. Sure, we identify that the treatment is needed, but where do we go? Um, and having that shortage of availability is, is a problem that continually works to get addressed. So now we identified what you need, or now we identified what's available, excuse me. Um, and now we identified what those levels of care are. That's great, but I've still got this person in my office and I know they need one of those. Uh, how does an addiction professional determine what the most appropriate level of care is? Um, so this is a quick glance at these. This is not, uh, don't think that because you've taken this, you're going to be able to jump in and know exactly where to go and where to send someone, um, but just kind of meant to be that basic understanding of what we look at uh, when we're assigning the level of care during that assessment. Uh, so as you can see, it's multidimensional, six separate ASAM dimensions exist. Dimension one, intox acute intoxication or withdrawal potential. This is uh, this is looking at how much a person uses, when is the last time they used, and how often do they use. Is this a person that drinks three beers at seven days a week and has some concern? Is this a person that is IV heroin and has been using daily for the last 18 months? Um, this is going to determine the need for detox or withdrawal management. Uh, a lot of these dimensions, so when we look at them, it's kind of a mix. We focus on the here and now. So what's going on right now? But you also take into consideration historical context. So if I have an uh, individual who has had seizures, who has had life-threatening withdrawal symptoms from drinking, but they haven't drank for a month, I would identify that they're probably at a low risk for withdrawal right now. They've gone past that 48 to 72 hour danger window. Um, but I do know if this person starts drinking again, they don't just have a couple shots, they drink heavily and they have a withdrawal potential uh, if they were to relapse. So it's still paying attention to historical context, but also uh, a focus on the here and now. Uh, so level one, again, this is looking at when's the last time they used, what are they using? Uh, different substances come with different levels of withdrawal or detox. Um, alcohol and benzodiazepines being the most likely to be life-threatening. Uh, heroin and opiates likely to be those that are just very, very discomforting. Um, cocaine stimulants, uh, tobacco, cannabis, and some of those others. Uh, the withdrawal symptoms and detox potential is lesser. Um, it's still there. It still has physiological concerns, but it is less focused than some of the others. So moving from that first dimension, so we've identified what they're using, how they use, what level of addiction do they have. So remember that SUDs can be ranged mild, moderate, severe. Next, we're going to take a look at biomedical conditions and complications. What is going on physio physiologically with this person? Um, just because a person has it doesn't mean it places them at higher risk. So if I have chronic back pain that's managed uh, with opiates, but I've been abusing them, how likely is that back pain to cause me concerns that makes treatment unlikely? I'm going to have to get that chronic pain managed either with something other than an opiate or some other form, or I'm going to have to work on creating an opiate plan that is something I can stick to. Um, this might be uh, pregnancy would be a biomedical condition that is kind of important to pay attention to. Um, so identifying what underlying issues might be there that need addressing. Um, as an addiction professional, this is where that integrated integrative care comes in. Um, I'm not going to help you with some of your medical conditions. I don't have that degree anywhere, and my white coat is not at the dry cleaner. Um, but I might refer you out to a primary care physician. Uh, I might recommend that you go to urgent care uh, or the emergency department and get something taken care of because it's likely to cause problems soon. Um, so these are those things that are going to help determine that that biomedical is this person stable. 
is this person going through, you know, do they have a high level of cirrhosis that they're going to need a liver transplant? And that's going to be something that's going to dictate how we provide treatment. Um, another part of this is, is this a cause or a consequence of substance use? So a cause of substance use could be that chronic pain situation. Uh, individual in a motor vehicle accident, severe pain, uh, limited range of motion, they are in a constant level of pain. Uh, painkillers was their, their preferred method of pain management, and then they became uh, graduated into a higher level of addiction. Um, so that would be a situation where a cause of their addiction stemmed from uh, a medical condition. The other could be consequences. Uh, this could be pancreatitis, uh, like I mentioned, cirrhosis, um, some sort of concerns or issues that are a result of their drug and alcohol use. Um, so we're fully assessing the person's medical stability, again, at a level within our scope. Um, this is often done through history. Uh, if you're at an integrated care, you may have a physician or a provider that does an h &P and is able to fully assess this more. Uh, but this is kind of a, a rough understanding based on presentation and what the individual self reports. Third dimension, so dimension three is emotional, behavioral, cognitive concerns. Is there a need for mental health services? Again, we're gonna look at this as a range. Uh, a person may have major depressive disorder that is currently managed by uh, uh, antidepressant through, that they get through their primary care physician. Okay, it's there. We should note it. We should continue to monitor to make sure it's stable and working. Uh, this could be the individual that has uh, significant emotional concerns, that has bipolar, has not been medicated, is frequently in manic episodes. Um, so we need to address that sooner than the other. That's going to place them at a higher risk than the individual who may have concurrent uh, mental health services. Um, we're going to look at these. Are these acute or chronic? Um, this is, is this something that has been happening for the last couple of weeks or maybe the last couple of months as their addiction has gotten worse? Or is this something this person's had since age 10? Um, this could be something a person's been dealing with their entire life. And then this is their baseline, which is different than an acute individual where this is not baseline. They have a higher level of emotional, behavioral, cognitive functioning. Uh, and it's a different focus of treatment. Uh, again, primary or secondary condition. Uh, primary would be that this is a mental health condition separate from substance use disorder. Um, and a secondary would be this is something that is caused by their substance use disorder. A very common one here could be PTSD. Another one is uh, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder or ADHD. Um, conduct disorder, ODD, uh, those things may have been there first. And in order to, you know, the term self-medicate or to adequately cope with the symptoms of those conditions, they may have used drugs and alcohol to do that. Uh, the other term would be some of these may have been caused due to their drug and alcohol use. Um, trauma is often likely to follow uh, those with substance use disorders. It may be something that because of their intoxication, they were um, sexually assaulted or uh, uh, went through some sort of uh, violent trauma due to their addiction. So it's looking at which is which. Um, it could be if we get rid of the addiction, could the mental health come around to a better baseline? Or is this something that they're both going to need that co-occurring or dual disorder uh, focus? Next dimension, dimension four, readiness to change. Do they really even wanna be in your office? Why are they here? Who sent them? How'd they get here? Do they seem to want to get better? Um, this is those, uh, especially in an outpatient, well, actually at all the levels of care, but often at that outpatient, as I mentioned it being a often court ordered starting point, um, not everyone wants to go to treatment. But sometimes the alternative is 30 to 90 days in jail and treatment doesn't sound so bad all of a sudden. So this is gauging whether or not this person has internal or external motivation. 
Um, sometimes it is lost. So external motivation could be, I'm doing this because I'm CPS told me I have to, or I don't see my kids. Uh, my significant other said I either stop or she moves or they move out. Um, this could be that kind of external motivation. Um, then there's the internal. My life is off track and I want to stop. I know that my family has said it. I know that there's been some externals, but I have this internal desire to make my life better. Um, and just because a person is court ordered or family sends them to treatment doesn't mean they don't have internal motivation. Um, an individual may be court ordered to treatment, but I can tell you that everyone with a probation officer does not follow through with treatment. Um, so just because I'm externally motivated doesn't mean I'll follow through. So those, even those individuals with some external motivation, just by coming in to talk about their concerns shows they have some internal motivation to change. Um, the trans theoretical stage of change. Uh, this is a model to describe change behaviors ranging from pre-contemplation through maintenance. Uh, Pre-contemplation would be an individual that doesn't believe they have a problem. Contemplation, an individual believes they have a problem, but it's not something they want to take care of. Um, yeah, I know I drink. It's just the weekends. I only drink a case or two every three to four days a week, but I still have a job. So they identify that it's probably not the best for them, but they don't have a desire to change. So that would be that contemplation. Uh, once that ambivalence is whether or not my problem needs to be solved, they would move into a preparation stage, which means they've identified that they have a problem and they're ready to start figuring it out on how to create change. Uh, after preparation, an individual would move into an action stage of change. This is where they've started to implement behavioral changes. They are starting to do things differently. Um, a person in a maintenance stage of change, generally six months or greater, uh, that changed behavior, it has just been more integrated into their daily lifestyle. This is a person that is doing recovery without really as much effort. Um, there may always be backslides to old behaviors. Um, just because we stop doing it for a little while doesn't mean uh, the old me doesn't come out. Um, so it's that stage of change ranging from, again, that pre-contemplation through. Um, does a person understand their addictive behavior? Do they get that they even have a problem? Um, there are those that might be a right to maintain pathology. Um, these are often the ones that say, well, it's legal and I shouldn't have been arrested for driving on the sidewalk, so I don't get it. Um, it's legal, I thought this was America. Um, that have this lack of understanding that their addictive use is not helping them. Um, the analogy I often use for these individuals to help uh, visualize it is uh, if you were out fishing in a boat and your boat got a small hole in it, is it going to sink? Yes, it's going to sink slowly, but eventually your boat is going to sink. And the question is, is how many small holes do you want to put in your boat before you start to address the behaviors? Um, so sometimes helping with that motivational enhancement, uh, helping a person see that there could be a benefit to their change can help move them from that pre-contemplation contemplation into a preparation or higher, helping them develop a greater level of internal motivation, talking a person into agreeing to change on their own. Um, motivational interviewing, motivational enhancement therapy, uh, those are often things done at this dimension to help push a person to understand the need for uh, help. So we've got the first four dimensions, the last two. Um, this is dimension five, relapse or continued use potential. How likely are they going to continue to use if we don't offer any interventions? What's the likelihood that they're going to use again? Um, based on the severity of the likelihood will increase the risk uh, in the higher level of care would follow. Um, so we're looking at a individual's ability to cope with their triggers or stressors. What do they do when they're angry? What do they do when they're sad, lonely? Uh, how do they cope with? This could be someone who is the adult child of an alcoholic and hasn't understood how that's impacted their life. Um, social integration. Do they have social skills outside of drinking? 
if what do you do for fun turns into I go bowling and drink a 12 pack, I go to the bar and play Kino. And then on weekends, I have a barbecue where we all drink. Well, all of their social activities are revolved around drinking. If they don't make adjustments, they're at a high likelihood to continue to use. Um, this also might be a history of recovery in the past. Does this person have two years of recovery that they've maintained in the past so they've done it? They just relapsed and need to figure out how to get back on track. So that might be a different level of care. It may look severe, but given their history of success in treatment, it may result in a lower level of care because they just need to reinforce and get back, you know, back on the wagon, I suppose. Um, another part to look at is their awareness of their triggers. Did they even know why they use? Um, do they have an understanding of what is likely to make them use again? Last dimension we're going to look at is dimension six. Uh, this is the recovery or living environment. Um, if you understand addictions, this is kind of where the peer recovery coach often comes into focus. This is that supportive services. What do I have? to help me stay clean. So dimension five, what skills do I possess to help me stay clean on my own? Dimension six, what barriers, obstacles, hurdles, or supports do I have that are going to affect my ability to maintain recovery? Do I have a, a, a family member with 20 years sobriety that can help me understand what's going on? Or does my significant other have just as much of a problem as I do and going home doesn't sound good? Uh, homelessness, this could be employment, uh, income level, education, um, cultural issues, uh, cultural assimilation, spiritual, uh, legal problems. These are those things that make it just that much harder to be successful. So you need treatment. Dimensions one through five says you need to go somewhere, but you don't have a car, you don't have childcare, you don't have employment to pay for a cab, you don't have, you don't have, you don't have, it makes treatment less likely to be successful because these obstacles or barriers to treatment are in the way. Uh, a lot of these, uh, this is a world of peer recovery coaching can help with almost what appears to be a case management or a uh, ability to, to assist that individual in identifying and creating solutions for these. Uh, coming up with long-term solutions for housing or education or child care. Um, so these are those outside factors that what do I have uh, to help me get through? So those are the six dimensions of care. We look at those again, uh, acute intoxication or withdrawal potential. How much, how bad do they need detox? Uh, ASAM2, medical conditions. What medical conditions are likely to interfere with their ability to succeed in treatment? Uh, dimension three, emotional, behavioral, cognitive, what mental health concerns, what other types of things might interfere with their ability to maintain their recovery efforts right now. Dimension four, readiness to change. So we are looking at their desire to even get better. Um, do they need some motivation to change or are they ready to do this? Uh, dimension five, that continued use. If we don't help, how likely are they to stop on their own? Do they have the skills? Do they have the knowledge? Do they have uh, the ability to develop uh, some sort of life outside of use? And then followed by dimension six, that supportive environment. So we take all six dimensions. We do what's known as a biopsychosocial, biological, sociological, psychological assessment. We take that and then as a clinician, we use the magic given to us in school or through experience, you know, the magic that makes us counselors. Uh, we create that conceptualization of what concerns are there. Um, we range them by dimension. And then we're going to assign a risk rating to each one, ranging from critical to no risk. Um, so we would then kind of, you could call it score it um, zero to four. And then based on those uh, scores or based on those risk ratings, that's going to then go into a matrix uh, that kind of says, well, if they're high in six, high in five, low in two and three, maybe they need this care. If they're high in three and low in four. So based on the scores that are placed, it will determine what is the most appropriate level of care. 
Um, even being an expert or an addiction professional doesn't mean we dictate levels of care. Uh, that client has a right to say, that's great that you think I need this, but I'm going to go over there and try that one. Um, so this is the best way to kind of understand um, what an individual needs. So you see that person that presents family member, uh, client, uh, probationer, uh, someone you comes into your office that you know needs help. Uh, so this is intended to kind of help you understand how do we know what kind of help they need? What are we looking for? What kind of things are important and how do I get them to help that will help? Um, so I appreciate you guys joining me for this webinar. Uh, if there are any questions, uh, we have a few minutes left here that I think we can work to go through those. Um, otherwise, Karen and Sarah told me I got to talk for the entire hour and I'm able to do that. So we don't have any questions in the chat right now. So feel free to put any in if you'd like to. Um, so Ken, I don't know if there's anything you want to elaborate on a little more, anything you you might have had to you know skip over for time. Um, and if not, you know, feel free to just share any um, info about services that you guys offer at Odyssey House. Just you know, anything that would be good for our attendees to um, have some more background on. Sure. Um, so Odyssey House has three main locations. Our main location is Flint, and then we have Saginaw, and then on office uh, here in Port Huron. Um, we offer, and I'm going to get yelled at if I get it wrong, I believe we offer a 35, 37, 31, 25, 21, 1, and 0.5. So amongst our facilities, we have the full range or full continuum of care. Uh, locally here in Port Huron, we offer an outpatient level one uh, and then the point five of early intervention. So we have outpatient counseling with individuals and in multiple groups a week. Um, as an organization, we also have a detox facility, full long-term residential, uh, and then as an organization, multiple recovery houses. Um, so we do have a full gamut uh, of services as ourselves. I see someone. So Amy, I'm guessing you wanted the risk ratings. Because no one ever cares about the references. We just have to put them to show that I didn't make this up. Um, this is this part is the skill, uh, the dimensional risk rating. Uh, this is the one that most clinicians for the first six months of doing assessment will have the ASAM uh, criteria book with them. Um, it's really understanding what's the difference between a one and a two. Um, this is the one that clinical skill, uh, consultation for areas where it's kind of gray. Um, and then this is the one that clinical interpretation can adjust what some may see as a two, the other sees as a three. Um, I can say in my five years experience, I think I've placed a four on maybe two, uh, two individuals on just one dimension. Um, this is that high lethality. This is if we don't do something now, the outcome is very bad. Uh, the one individual was homeless uh, and sleeping under the freeway in Montana in January, uh, where temperatures get to 10 to 15 below zero. Um, so if we didn't help that person find housing today, uh, it was at a high risk that they went and slept under the freeway, they might not wake up. Um, so for is not as common in the world that I've been in working with some residential and outpatient facilities. Um, it's often that range from zero to three is more common. Um, one of the other parts okay, that I- Okay, so we're oh, not seeing any additional questions. So I just wanna thank Ken for joining us today and sharing all this info. Um, this is a lot of really good content. We do have um, Ken slides that we can make available to attendees if people think that that would be helpful. Um, there's some, some really good info to have there. So thanks again, Ken, and for all of you for attending our session today. This presentation is one of many webinars scheduled throughout the month of September. You can still register for any upcoming presentations, including our one at two o'clock today and our one at 6 p.m. tonight. 
Thanks again, and we look forward to seeing you at the next webinar.